The presidency isn't the only thing on the ballot this November. Five states are voting on legalizing cannabis, but the ballots of Congress could also give cannabis supporters the juice they need to get to federal legalization. Our next guest is Safira Galoob, perhaps the most powerful marijuana lobbyist in Washington. Safira, welcome to Stansberry. Thanks for having me. And I'm also joined by the editor of Cannabis Capitalist. He is, of course, Tom Carroll. Jessica, thanks. And uh, Safira, welcome. And Tom, let's begin by asking Safira for her assessment on whether the U.S. Senate has the votes for Senate legalization. Well, I think the, the, the really the question about what constitutes legalization, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there are different approaches towards harmonizing federal and state law and ending the conflict between federal and state law and whether or not uh, or, or which piece of legislation actually advances towards we'll call it, you know, a, a, a decriminalizing and creating a national commercial market, the, the whether or not we have the votes will depend on which piece of legislation moves forward. It feels like the word decriminalization has been very deliberately put out there as opposed yeah. to legalization. So if you could maybe distinguish between, you know, what that means to the world, you know, in the next few years, if we decriminalize versus legalize. No, I think it's, I think, and I think the more nuanced we can become in our vernacular and in our advocacy, the more likely we're going to set forth a pathway that really does open access to patients and create commercial opportunity for this industry. So, you know, cannabis is a Schedule One substance, mm -hmm. illegal Schedule One substance on the Controlled Substances Act. And decriminalizing it wouldn't change its status on the CSA, which means that industry stakeholders who are in 33 states with medical programs, 11 states with adult use, and 47 states with some sort of legal cannabis still cannot bank cannabis legally. There is banking access. There are still uh, tax penalties for being a commercial um, cannabis industry, stake, industry stakeholder and, and, and having a business in the, in the space. Um, there are immigration consequences and all a, a, a number of other um, just consequences of it being on the schedule. Decriminalization has to do with the penalties that would be associated with possession or commercializing and transferring possession of cannabis. And so while we are seeing decriminalization as part of the posturing of obviously uh, Vice Presidential Candidate, um, Vice President Biden and his administration and other folks who are looking for more anal criminal change, decriminalization is only part of the way there and does not get us where we need to be to uh, capture this thriving in industry and to give patients access they demand and deserve. I wanna ask you a question, Safira, about where you see your openings with Republican lawmakers in particular. You've talked a little bit about some real kingmakers on the Senate side in the Republican party. Who do you target most? You know, our biggest champion on the Senate side is Cory Gardner. He has championed not just the strategy for uh, ending the conflict between federal and state law and being one of the lead educators for colleagues um, on his side of the aisle, but he's been a bridge builder between Democrats and Republicans. We also have a, a, a good champion in Mr. Kramer from uh, North Dakota. And you know, once North Dakota passed its program, suddenly we saw um, their congressional delegation really get to know the industry and really understand what's important. Um, we have a good friend in, in, in Senator Murkowski. She's always been an outstanding uh, supporter. Uh, Senator Daines has been outstanding. Um, but as you can hear in my voice, or as I tilt my head slightly, there are these, these are the races that are in toss up. So if these yeah. folks don't return, we are, and depending on which states legalize, we are in a kind of recalibrating uh, who our champions are in the R side. And depending of course on how many R's return versus how many D's, that will also impact what the strategy looks like. Talk a little bit about a Democratic controlled Senate. If that's the eventuality, if that's where we head after November 3rd, is that a slam dunk for legalization or should we be more cautious with that view? Absolutely more cautious. You know, right now the rules require 60 votes to get through cloture. Today, it's not 51 votes, it's, it's 60 votes. So depending on who returns 
and which states legalize and what the rules of the Senate look like, not even regarding cannabis, but just what the rules generally look like in terms of passing legislation will impact what the likelihood of, of advancing cannabis. And, and I will add one more piece I think is important is that just because cannabis has momentum in the Democratic Party, it doesn't mean that every moderate Democrat has supported you know, comprehensive legalization. I mean, Senator Feinstein from the great state of California with whom I work, I work really closely with the California industry. She hasn't been uh, the champion that we'd hoped uh, and she has really been slower to embrace some of these policies and this policy reform that this industry demands and deserves. So if I could jump in for a minute, you know, let's say, let's say President Trump wins a second term and the Senate stays in Republican hands. Mm -hmm. What does the path to legalization look like under that scenario? I think you see a, 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 a very broad criminal justice, social justice piece of legislation such as the Moore Act uh, led by Chairman Nadler in the House passing the House and coming to the Senate, I think you then see a, a counter proposal, uh, not necessarily a, a piece of legislation like the States Act, but something that, that acknowledges that states will want to have the right to kind of maintain uh, you know, the integrity over their cannabis paradigms, if they even want to have a cannabis paradigm. So the ability for a state to decide their state of play in their state. And I see, think, think we then begin to see some negotiation between a more moderate House, excuse me, a more moderate Senate towards legalization and a, a more bullish House who's obviously pushing uh, the momentum of these bills forward. Wow, so, that, so that's interesting. So even with Trump and even with the Senate staying as is, Cory Gardner in place, you believe that the negotiations will start basically with the Moore Act which is a very comprehensive piece of legislation, right? And that's probably the, you know, that's probably the, the, the high bar in the Senate and it gets, it gets watered down a bit based on some of those things. Well, I, I think that's, I, I think that is a very positive opinion uh, for, for the cannabis industry, you know, if, if Trump stays in place. Can we ask you, Safira, what has been the most effective message that you've used to convince people um, in the current environment and how might that message change in terms of how you get people in the Senate and the House to support cannabis legalization? I, mean, I think one of the things that we've seen in terms of uh, reform, particularly with uh, Republicans, I'll start with Republicans, is that, that when states introduce a state-led paradigm, a state cannabis, a set of cannabis laws in their state, the sky does not fall. And that now people have access to medicine in a way that they didn't before. And people who would rely on medicines, opioids, for example, and pain medications that would, that would be you know, rampant addictants, they are now finding alternatives, safer, healthier ways to treat pain and other uh, illnesses that cannabis treats. The second thing we are seeing is that states are in, a, the, are in the best position to set and oversee the programs. And so what that does for particularly a Republican uh, philosophy is that it's not giving the federal government one more responsibility over states who wanna treat this industry differently. It's asking the citizens of that state, the government that's of that state, the regulatory paradigm that that state set, sets up to oversee this program. And those lawmakers understand, appreciate, and respect that, that argument. Is there a particularly staunch um, opponent that you've turned into an advocate? Yeah, uh, a staunch opponent. Well, we haven't gotten Senator Langford on our side, if you're curious about that. I can tell you that when I first started lobbying this issue in 2016, uh, I went through um, well, every single office, house office, that had a state program. And at the time, they were like 100 and 16. And I think there were 10 offices who'd ever been contacted by cannabis. And when I, and I was, I was, I was lobbying the safe banking. And I, I will tell you, there were more hell no's about cannabis banking than anything. I, I mean, I couldn't even count the number on one hand, the number of supporters. And then when the safe banking came up for, for a vote in the house last September, 91 Republicans, including some of those hell no congressional members were absolute yeses, including Mr. McCarthy. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Do you work with any of the big state United States uh, uh, multi-state operators? You know, do they call on you and um, what, what is their ask of you? So, so I currently serve as the executive director of the National Cannabis Roundtable. Mm -hmm. And as you may know, uh, speaker, yeah. former Speaker of the House, John Boehner is our honorary chair. So I have mm -hmm. the honor and pleasure working closely with him. And we have uh, a number of very respected multi-state operators, um, including Cresco Labs and TrueLeave. And, and they're, they're in a really, um, uh, they're really in a position of, of leadership in the industry. I mean, if you talk mm -hmm. to the CEOs of those two companies, they would say that high water raises all ships. So they are 100% committed to uh, not just profitability, but social corporate responsibility and, mm -hmm. and seeing their role and responsibility in the industry as having to set not just standards, but kind of parameters around safety and protocols around being the, the, the most responsible stewards of the industry and the communities in which they serve. Do you have non-cannabis companies calling on you, like, like potentially, uh, you know, businesses that are potentially big winners with legal cannabis, right? Like pharmaceutical firms or, you know, some of the big beer companies, things like that. You know, are they behind the scenes trying to position and figure out where, where the world goes? You know, cannabis is part of the ecosystem of our country. And so we've had contact, we've been contacted by realtors, insurance folks, mm -hmm. uh, tobacco and spirits, the, uh, the folks within retail shopping, um, not just kind of mainstream stores, but folks that kind of you get sold products that are, or in a supply chain, if it doesn't sell on the first line, yeah. it can be sold to a secondary market. What happens to cannabis products, you know, once they get sold to a secondary market? Um, and I don't want to call them discount stores, but stores that are, that are, that are capturing oversupply or things that didn't sell. So at yeah. this point, any community that has cannabis is being touched by cannabis whether it's the Walmart selling supplies or the plumbers and the electricians. I mean, we are 100% threaded into the ecosystem of our economy and it's yeah. only growing and deepening. Lastly, if we can wrap up with this, there are five states, as I mentioned, that have cannabis legalization on their ballots. What is the connection between their efforts and yours in terms of getting a federal legalization bill passed? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that you can count on in Washington is that lawmakers want to keep their jobs and they listen to their constituents. And so when a state passes an initiative, uh, and depending on the time period of when they pass the initiative to when a commercial uh, market is created and you know, there are dollars coming into a community, the, the when that happens, when, when these programs become live, when, when, when businesses are now up and running, when dollars are being generated and reinvested in the community, those lawmakers take note. And you could almost, if, you, if I were to look at some, some specific lawmakers, you could almost track their um, staffers' interest. Hmm. And uh, enthusiasm towards visits and calls for me, <laughs> based on the, the the caliber of their home market, whether it be in their district or in their state, and the dollars generated, the jobs generated, hmm. the revenue reinvested, and so there's a very close correlation to the success that these initiatives happen in home states and what lawmakers will do on the Hill, particularly in these ballot initiatives, which are very, very much people driven, not even lawmaker driven. Mm -hmm. So these, you know, this mm -hmm. is, the, it doesn't get any more grassroots than that. Safira Galoub from the Liaison Group and the National Cannabis Roundtable. Thanks so much for joining us. And we hope to have you back after the election once we know a little bit more about the direction of the Senate. Thanks again. And if you want to see much more content like this, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.